I'm Dr. Versace from Australia and today I'm going to talk a little bit about lens design and things that we can do to improve our offering with lens implants. Um, and you know, the, the reality is that lenses are available to us, many, many. In Australia we have more than 220 lenses registered for use and you would think on one hand everything's been invented, so why are we talking today about new lens designs, new features of lenses? And the reality is that even presbyopia correcting lenses have been around for almost 40 years. This is the Pierce refractive lens that was used almost 40 years ago. And this lens worked. Patients got 6.6 and they got N6. But there were problems. And we should ask if presbyopia correcting lenses are around and available to us and work well, why is it that most lens implants now are still monofocal? This is old data, this is 2018, but the figures have moved around a bit, but you still say at least 85% of lens implants around the world are monofocal. It tells us there's something not yet perfect about presbyopia correcting lenses. And the problem is that <clears throat> there are things that can in impact the quality of vision that patients experience with these lenses. Here's a patient I operated a couple of months ago. She's a nurse, she wanted really good close vision, she insisted she wanted to read vials without having to wear reading glasses. So in this case, I chose to use a full-strength diffractive multifocal lens, in this case a Synergy. Surgery totally uneventful. But the patient comes back after a week, two weeks, and tells me her vision is terrible. She can't see for far or for near, it's all just blurred. And she's telling me she sees halos, well yeah, it's a diffractive lens, but the halos are not symmetric, they're not round. And the problem for her really is that this lens is not well aligned with the visual axis. She has a relatively large angle alpha, almost half a millimetre, but you know, we'd normally accept that for most lens implants. Uh, the trouble is for her, that with the lens in her eye, where the lens is sitting in the capsule back, her displacement from the visual axis is almost 0.7 of a millimetre. That's a big displacement. So we took her back to surgery and we re in the lens. So I moved it in the capsule bag after two and a half weeks and better aligned it with the visual axis. So now the lens is with 300 micrometers of the visual axis. That's great. But you can see in the video that even though I can move the lens, you really cannot put the lens exactly where you want it to sit. It will just find its own place in the bag. So I raise this case to say that the first challenge that we should try and resolve is our ability to align the lens optic with the visual axis. With pretty much all the lenses on the market, you cannot do that. This idea of nudging a lens one way or the other just doesn't work well enough. And I put it to you that if we can align a lens with the visual axis, we can eliminate a lot of the problems that we experience with more complex optical designs. And one way to align it with the visual axis is to attach the lens to the capture axis, which you can create on the visual axis. So that's one problem that we can solve with rexus fixation of an intraocular lens. The other problem is visual quality, halos at night. And the fact is that for all diffractive multifocal lenses, patients will experience halos. Now you'll hear in the talks you go to that most patients with halos are not bothered by them. Yes, they have them, but they can still drive. It doesn't stop them doing things, but they exist. And we know if they exist, then the occasional patient will be bothered by it and it will be a problem, particularly for me as a doctor, having to see the patient tell me after three months they still got these terrible halos and what went wrong. This is uh, some data we produced over the last eight years where I use this tool to measure and quantify the halos and glare for a range of different lenses that we use. And what you can see in this is for all the diffractive multifocal lenses, all of them, they get significant haloing. The higher the bar, the more halos and unwanted visual phenomena patients experiencing. Over on your right hand side of that are the refractive segmental lenses, the lentis platform, the teleon platform. And they are, they are noticeable for having minimal unwanted visual phenomena. So the second thing I've put to you in this presentation is that if we rexus fix a lens and we avoid diffractive and we use instead refractive segmental optics, we can perhaps solve the second problem of unwanted visual phenomena. So let's dive a bit deeper into this. You hear centration discussed a lot, or not at all sometimes, but if we discuss it a lot, there are many things you could consider. Should we align a lens with the pupil? 
Should we align it with the visual axis? Should we align it with the capsular bag? Um, <clears throat> what about tilting of the lens? Does that matter? These are all things to consider. And we hear about these angles, angle alpha, angle kappa. What do they mean? Let's break it down. In the end, what matters is the visual axis. We want the optic of the lens to be aligned with the visual axis. How do we do that? It's quite hard to measure the visual axis. We have devices like uh, Pentacam, like IOL Master. Uh, these devices will give us some indices to tell us where the visual axis is, but it's not that easy during surgery to know where it is, and it's not much use knowing where it is if you can't align your lens with it. So, visual axis, and then angle kappa. We hear a lot about angle kappa, and angle kappa is very applicable to corneal bay through refractive surgery because most laser platforms will use the pupil as a reference point. Angle kappa tells us where the visual axis is in relation to the pupil. That's angle kappa. Angle alpha is more applicable to lens implant surgery. Angle alpha tells us where the visual axis is in relation to the limbus. And the limbus is probably a good representation of the capsular bag, which is where a lens will sit. So angle alpha tells us the relationship of visual axis to the equator of the capsular bag, and that's the index we should use for lens implant surgery. Now I like using this device, the eye trace. And the eye trace for me is useful because I can actually look at the lens in the eye, and I can see the real lens in the eye. This is a femtus lens in this case. Look how nice and clear the, the capsules are. And I can actually see the lens in the eye. I can see where the visual axis is marked in red, and I can see where that fits with the lens optic. Otherwise, it's very hard to know with a, a real patient after surgery exactly where the visual axis has a relationship to the lens. You might have your LX, LY you take from the IOL master. Well, that tells you where the visual axis is. But your lens may be sitting somewhere other than the middle of the capsular bag, and you don't know unless you use a device like this. This just helps me to understand what's happening to those patients who have a slightly unexpected result such as the first case I showed you for a patient with a seemingly perfect surgery but where the vision was not what we expected. It helps us know if alignment of a lens is the problem. There's some stuff published about centration of lenses but it's very confused literature because some of them use angle alpha. Some of these lenses are diffractive and some are apodized. So here's a case publication looking at the Alcon diffractive restore multifocal lens. And with this lens it turns out that it matters where it's aligned with the pupil as well as with the visual axis. And so if you have a lens where there's correctopia and the pupil does not overlie the center of the lens, you get funny visual effects. And in this case, the surgeons actually used an argon laser to do a laser pupiloplasty to pull the pupil so the pupil was better aligned with the lens and that alleviated the patient's symptoms. So it gets complex when you think we should have a lens aligned with the visual axis but ideally also aligned with the pupil. Often you can't have both because of angle alpha and angle kappa having different values. We talk about a lens, which is what I'm talking about today, such as the Lentus platform, Teleon, Femtus, Comfort, all these lenses. These are refractive segmental lenses. And to me, one of the benefits of this design is that we've got a huge landing area. All the green area, if the visual axis falls anywhere in the green area, the patient will see well. So unlike a diffractive lens where you've got lots of risky zones where the visual axis should not be, here you've got a large area. At the same time, you want to make sure your visual axis is not enough to strike the junction of the far and near segment of the lens. Because if it does, you're going to get some funny visual phenomena. And in this case, I should have put the lens in differently. I should have placed the near segment infrotemporal. That way the visual axis will be clearly through the distance part of the lens. So this segmental refractive platform is very forgiving for exactly where you put it in the eye with certain specific provisos. So now I will routinely implant this lens with the near segment infrotemporal to give the best chance of the visual axis always being cleanly in the distance vision segment of the lens. <clears throat> what else might we like to resolve with the lenses that we use? And I'll say the big one is negative dysphotopsia. Negative dysphotopsia often goes unreported because a patient will say, I see a bit of a black thing here, but it doesn't bother me. So you don't make much fuss about it. But if you go by what's published, we have up to 3% of patients 
who long term will experience negative dysphotopsia. So I think it's something we do need to address with lens design. We know how we can deal with it, but it'd be nice to have lenses where it doesn't occur in the first place. There are different approaches to having a lens which prevents negative dysphotopsia. But the common theme really is to somehow have that lens in the plane of the anterior capsule and have the capsular rexus somehow attached to the lens itself. So Sam Maskett came out with a lens which is marketed by Morcher, which is designed specifically to avoid negative dysphotopsia. This is a monofocal lens and effectively what you do is the anterior capsular rexus fits into this rim in the flange on the edge of the optic of the lens. It's not a new idea. Marie Tassignon has this lens for many years for paediatric cataract surgery where you do a primary posterior capsular rexus and you have an anterior capsular rexus and both those rexes go into a flange in the edge of the lens for paediatric cataract surgery. Uh, Sri Ganesh in India had designed a lens with these interesting haptics and the idea is to put it in the capsular bag and those haptics come out and sit in front of the anterior capsular rexus. So it holds the lens up in the plane of the anterior capsular rexus. What I'm most interested in is this lens. This is the Femtus lens. This is the lens that's designed to attach to the anterior capsular rexus. It's a, <clears throat> a lens that can be an Edof lens with two strengths of near ad. It can be a toric lens. It's not a difficult thing to do. The lens is implanted into the capsular bag and you add an extra 45 seconds for the lens to actually oncolate the lens, to attach it to the anterior capsular rexus with four very fine flanges that you pull up to hook around the anterior capsular rexus. So at the end of surgery, this lens is sitting securely attached to the anterior capsular rexus, stable, flat, and aligned perfectly with your capsular rexus. It's not free in the capsular bag. You do, of course, have to have a perfect capsular rexus. So you probably have to use a femtosecond laser so that you can make first a perfectly circular capsular rexus that has strength. Secondly, a capsular rexus of a precise size, so the lens can attach to it and not fall off. And third, ideally, you have a system that allows you to create a capsular rexus perfectly aligned with the visual axis, so that when the lens is attached to the capsular rexus, the lens is aligned with the visual axis. And here's an example of the Femtus lens that I've shown before perfectly aligned with the visual eye, which means we no longer have these outliers, we no longer have the occasional patient where maybe the visual axis is impacting the junction of far and near segments. There's been a few studies now to look at the Femtus lens. We did one in Australia with 50 consecutive patients and we used the EDOF Femtus. So the lens attached to the computer that has a prop. There are two specific features of this lens that we need to understand. First is the physical. When I'll take the lens, instead of putting it free flow in the capsule of one, what happens when you happens with time? A trap occur in the anterior capsule that time. And the second feature is what it looks like to use this segmental refractive eat off lens. How does it go for visual performance? and to minimize or eliminate unwanted visual problems. So we looked at this and we did a study and right, you know, it's a very predictable lens and I expect that with time as we get bigger numbers we will see the refractive predictability is actually better than with a standard capture bag because we have a more predictable effective position. The lens is now always at the plane of the anterior capture. But when you put a lens in the bag, there's some variability for exactly where it will end up. And this is stable over time. So the lens is not moving up or down. The refractive stability is demonstrated. And all of that has been reproduced in a much bigger study in Europe, a collaborative study. To me, most important, 69% of patients who could see 6-6 and could read so that tells me that the majority of patients are getting functional vision, spectacle independent vision, that only has its lens, with this lens targeting emetropia in both eyes. And the defocus curve for this lens, even though in some ways it looks a bit like a bifocal, you've got two active segments, it behaves for complex reasons that I'll explain before. It behaves like a 
depth of focus lens. So the defocus curve I'm showing you here is very much like that for the Johnson & Johnson Symphony. Very much like defocus curve of Symphony. <clears throat> so for the we had just 60% of patients who were spectacular and the rest just wore reading glasses sometimes. This was a controlled study environment, of course, so with specific entry criteria. But that shows me what is possible with this segmental refractive design. And importantly, we were able to really minimise the incidence of halos and unwanted visual phenomena. This, this is the platform we're talking about, even though slightly different optic. So minimal halo formation. And when we actually scored patients in this trial for unwanted visual phenomena, they basically don't even register with the Femtus lens. It comes even better than the non rex fixated version of this optic. So the thing about putting this lens exactly is unwanted visual phenomena. <coughs> and when we ask them the question, the question is performance, these are all right down the bottom here. No one even gets above anything that's really good. So certainly quality of vision, I think, with this reflective segment, is very excellent. The second feature that I mentioned earlier to look at with a lens like this is how it performs mechanically to see if it's stable over time. There's no point putting the lens in there perfectly aligned with the digital axis and finding out that it's moved after six months. Uh, now the capsule, when it fibrosis, can exert a lot of force on the lens because there's a lot of fibrotic reaction going on. And you can imagine if I deliberately placed the capsule erexus like this because of a large angle alpha, you would wonder if the excess capsule on one side could pull the lens more centrally over time. So we measured this, it was documented with photographic <laughs> Uh, Im images and basically in summary this lens is absolutely stable so that up to six months the move that we see is 0 0.09 per millimeter 90 micrometers which is just noise in the measurement really and our ability to measure it accurately so I think we can be confident that if we put this lens in the eye we attach it to the anterior capture erexus aligned with the visual axis it will stay there over time it's not going to suddenly move and it does look amazing. The capsule does not and I mentioned we need to use a femtosecond laser to create the capsule erexus, and that is potentially the biggest barrier to using a lens like this. We have to use a femtosecond laser for certain of that. There are significant benefits, but of course we have to work out how we deal with that cost. Um, you can do a manual capsulorexis, but you can't do a manual capsulorexis really. You know, you cannot predictably create a five millimeter perfectly circular capsulorexis, perfectly aligned with the visual axis every time, no matter how good we think we are. I got away with it this time, but that's a one-off. That's because the femtosecond laser failed during the list, and I've promised this patient a femtus lens. But let's say you need to use some kind of automated capture erexus system to be able to use this lens and get its full potential. Uh, Zepto has been popular. Zepto has a benefit of being less expensive than a femtosecond laser. It's more portable, mobile between institutions. But it's sort of dropping in popularity, I would say. Uh, it's a relatively cumbersome thing to use. There are a lot of potential problems with using it. Uh, so I'm seeing less and less Zepto use as I travel around. Capture laser, I think, has a lot of problems. Capture laser technique of the the operating microscope. And unit. So I'm pretty excited to be using capture laser as a off of Fentus lens for less cost. The other benefit of capture laser as strong as your manual capture erexus. Your capture erexus is at least 1.3 times stronger than the second laser based So a capture laser capture erexus is really very strong. This is a great paper from guys. That matters. But I take the lens to the camera. It's not to be strong. But 
I'll, I'll modify it and, and be clear. So in the cases I've done, I've had a single complication using a femtosecond laser to create the anterior captured erexus and attach. So actually, it's very strong. And that was the case where I was able to go back and reposition the lens uh, sometime after surgery. So in winding up this talk, I would say that we have potentially resolved the problems I and want a visual phenomena, but eliminate them. We can align the dual axis, which is something very important for any and it actually opens up new lens designs. We can prevent capture the we can potentially achieve better refractive predictability through better effective lens position. We're certainly controlling for tilt because the lens is going to be in the plane of the anterior capsule uh, and halos and glare minimal with this optical design. We are achieving a, an extended range of focus. This is an EDOF lens as shown by the defocus curves. So it's filling out the range of vision and it's giving us more range of vision than we see with the monofocal EDOF lenses that are on the market. And it's high quality vision. So to me this is a wonderful lens and I like using it. I just have to work out how to be able to offer it to my patients without the full cost of femtosecond laser capture to excess creation. Thanks so much for listening to me and any questions you're very welcome to take.